Magic and the Brain, a magazine article by Susana Martinez Condi and Stephen L. Macknick. The spotlight shines on the magician's assistant. The woman in the tiny white dress is a luminous beacon of beauty radiating from the stage to the audience. The great Tom Sony announces he will change her dress from white to red. On the edge of their seats, the spectators strain to focus on the woman burning her image deep into their retinas. Tom Sony claps his hands and the spotlight dims ever so briefly before reflaring in a blaze of red. The woman is awash in a flood of redness. Whoa, just a moment there. Switching color with the spotlight is not exactly what the audience had in mind. The magician stands at the side of the stage, looking pleased at his little joke. Yes, he admits it was a cheap trick, his favorite kind, he explains devilishly. But you have to agree, he did turn her dress red along with the rest of her. Please indulge him and direct your attention once more to his beautiful assistant as he switches the light back on for the next trick. He claps his hands and the lights dim again. Then the stage explodes in a supernova of whiteness. But wait, her dress really has turned red. The great Tom Sony has done it again. The trick and its explanation by John Thompson, AKA the great Tom Sony, reveal a deep intuitive understanding of the neural process, processes taking place in a spectator's brains. The kind of understanding that we neuroscientists can appropriate for our own scientific benefit. Here's how the trick works. As Thompson introduces his assistant, her skin tight white dress wordlessly lures the spectators into assuming that nothing, certainly not another dress, could possibly be hiding under the white one. That reasonable assumption, of course, is wrong. The woman, excuse me, the attractive woman in her tight dress also helps to focus people's attention right where Thompson wants it, on the woman's body. The more they stare at her, and the better adapted their retinal neurons become to the brightness of the light and the color they perceive. All during Thompson's pattern, after his little joke, each spectator's visual system is undergoing a brain process called neural adaptation. The responsiveness of a neural system to a constant stimulus as measured by the firing rate of the relevant neurons decreases with time. It is as if neurons actively ignore a constant stimulus to save their strength for signaling that a stimulus is changing. When the constant stimulus is turned off, the adapted neurons fire a rebound response known as an after discharge. In this case, the adapting stimulus is the red light, red lit dress, and Thompson knows that the spectator's retinal neurons will rebound for a fraction of a second after the lights are dimmed. The audience will continue to see a red after image in the shape of the woman. During that split second, a trap door in the stage opens briefly and the white dress held on lightly in a place with fascinating tape and attached to invisible cables leading under the stage is ripped from her body. Then the lights come back up. Two other factors help to make the trick work. First, the lighting is so bright just before the dress comes off that when it dims, the spectators cannot see the rapid motions of the cables and the white dress as they disappear underneath the stage. The same temporary blindness can overtake you when you walk from a sunny street into a dimly lit shop. Second, 
Thompson performs the real trick only after the audience thinks it's already over. That gains him an important cognitive advantage. The spectators are not only looking for a trick at the critical moment, and so they slightly relax their scrutiny. New Science of Neuromagic Thompson's trick nicely illustrates the essence of stage magic. Magicians are, first and foremost, artists of attention and awareness. They manipulate the focus and intensity of human attention, controlling at any given instant what we are aware of and what we are not aware of. They do so in part by employing bewildering combinations of visual illusions, such as after images, obstacle illusions, which are smoke and mirrors, or special effects such as explosions, fake gunshots, precisely timed lightning controls, slate of hand, secret devices, and mechanical artifacts such as gimmicks. But the most versatile instrument in their bag of tricks may be the ability to create cognitive illusions. Like a visual illusions, cognitive illusions make mask excuse me, the perception of physical reality. Yet unlike visual illusions, cognitive illusions are not sensory in nature. Rather, they involve high level functions such as attention, memory, and casual inference. With all those tools at their disposal, well-practiced magicians make it virtually impossible to follow the physics of what is actually happening leaving the impression that the only explanation for the events is magic. Neuroscientists are just beginning to catch up with the magician's facility in manipulating attention and cognition. Of course, the aims of neuroscience are different from those of magic. The neuroscientist seeks to understand the brain and neuron underpinnings of cognitive functions, whereas the magician wants mainly to exploit cognitive weaknesses. Yet the techniques developed by magicians over centuries of stage magic could also be subtle and powerful probes in the hands of neuroscientists, supplementing and perhaps expanding the instruments already in experimental use. Neuroscience is becoming familiar with the methods of magic by subjecting magic itself to scientific study. In some cases, showing for the first time how some of its methods work in the brain. Many studies of magic conducted so far confirm what is known about co cognition and attention from earlier work in experimental psychology. A cynic might dismiss such efforts. Why do yet another study that simply confirms what is already well known? But such criticism misses the importance and purpose of these studies. By investigating the techniques of magic, neuroscientists can familiarize themselves with methods that they can adapt to their own purposes. Indeed, we believe that cognitive neuroscience could have advanced faster and investigators probed magicians' intuitions earlier. Even today, magicians may have a few tricks up their sleeves that neuroscientists have not yet adopted. By applying the tools of magic, neuroscientists can hope to learn how to design more robust experiments and to create more effective cognitive and visual illusions for exploring the neural basis of attention and awareness. Such techniques can not only make experimental studies of cognition possible with clever and highly attentive subjects, they can also lead to diagnostic and treatment methods for patients suffering from specific cognitive de deficits, such as attention deficits resulting from brain trauma, ADHD, attention deficit, 
hyperactivity disorder, Alzheimer's disease, and the like. The methods of magic might also be put to work in tricking patients to focus on the most important parts of their therapy while suppressing distractions that cause confusion and disorientation. Magicians use the general term misdirection to refer to the practice of diverting the, spe the spectator's attention away from a secret action. In the lingo of magic, misdirection draws the audience's attention towards the effect and away from the method, the secret behind the effect. Borrowing some terms from cognitive psychology, we have classified misdirection as overt and covert. The misdirection is overt if the magician redirects the spectator's gaze from the method, perhaps simply by asking the audience to look at a particular object. When the great Tom Sony introduces his lovely assistants, for instant, instance, he ensures that all eyes are on her. Covert misdirection, in contrast, is a subtler technique. There, too, the magician draws the spectator's attention, attentional spotlight or focus of suspicion away from the method, but without necessarily redirecting the spectator's gaze. Under the influ influence of covert misdirection, spectators may be looking directly at the method behind the trick, yet be entirely unaware of it. Cognitive neuroscience already recognizes at least two kinds of covert misdirection. In what is called change blindness, people fail to notice that something about a scene is different from the way it was before. The change may be expected or unexpected, but the key feature is that the observers do not notice it by looking at the scene at any one instant in time. Instead, the observer must compare the post-change state with the pre-change state. Inattentional blindness differs from change blindness in that there is no need to compare the current state with a scene from memory. Instead, people fail to notice an unexpected object that is fully visible directly in front of them. Psychologist Daniel J. Simmons invented a classic example of the genre. Simmons, a psychologist, Simmons and psychologist, excuse me, Christopher F. Shabris, both then at Harvard University, asked observers to count how many times a team of three basketball players pass a ball to each other while ignoring the passes made by three other players. While they're concentrating on counting, Half of the observers fail to notice that a person in gorilla suit walks across the scene. The gorilla even stops briefly at the center of the scene and beats his chest. No abrupt attention, interruption, or distraction was necessary to create this effect. The counting task was so absorbing that many observers who were looking directly at the gorilla nonetheless missed it. Controlling awareness in the wired brain. The possibilities of using magic as a source of cognitive illusion to help isolate the neural circuits responsible for specific cognitive functions seems endless. Neuroscientists recently borrowed a technique from magic that made volunteer subjects incorrectly link to events as cause and effect while images of the subject's brains were recorded. When event A precedes event B, we often conclude, rightly or wrongly, that A causes B. The skilled magicians take advantage of that predisposition by making sure that event A, say pouring water on a ball, always will precede event B, the ball disappearing. In fact, A does not cause B, but its prior appearance 
helps the magician make it seem so. Cognitive psychologists call this kind of effect illusory correlation. In an unpublished study in 2006, Kuhn and cognitive neuroscientists Ben A. Paris and Tim L. Hodgson, both then at the University of Exeter in England, showed videos of magic tricks that involved apparent violations of cause and effect to subjects undergoing functional magnetic resonance imaging. The subject's brain images were compared with those of a control group. People who watched videos showing no apparent casual violations. The investigators found greater action activation in the interior cingulate cortex among the subjects who were watching magic tricks than among the controls. The finding subjects that this brain area the findings suggest that this brain area may be important for interpreting casual and relationships. The work of Kuhn and his colleagues only begins to suggest the power of the techniques of major magic for manipulating attention and awareness while studying the psych physiology of the brain. If neuroscientists learn to use the methods of magic with the same skill as professional magicians, they too should be able to control awareness precisely and in real time. If they correlate the content of that awareness with the functioning of neurons, they will have the means to explore some of the mysteries of consciousness itself.